The following interview was conducted with, uh, for the, with Professor John C. Lindenlaub for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on April, April the 7th, Monday, April 7th, 2008, in Stewart 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Milwaukee and uh, went through high school there. And in applying to colleges, I, I believe I applied to three places. Uh, University of Wisconsin, a natural, Purdue University, and MIT. I was admitted to MIT, and that's where I went. Uh, How did you happen to, uh, tell us a little bit about high school. What was what, what some of your activities in high school? Was it a large school, or uh, and also do you have any siblings? Uh, I, I had three, three half-sisters. They were almost a half a generation older than I was, so I have no memory, really, of, of having sisters at home. I have lots of memories of going to sisters' houses for holidays and vacations sure. and things like that. Uh -huh. I believe the high school class was about 200 people, something like that. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate to be sort of the, the top of the class and I was one of the, I was one of the uh, audiovisual geeks in high school. <laughs> uh, did you, did you, was there a club that, or you sort of helped out a little we, bit? We helped out with the, the uh, I was going to say slide projectors. I, I don't even think, I think it was uh, film strips, film strips and movies. And the, the, the biggest advantage is you get out of study hall. <laughs> and so you could study if there was nothing else going on, but that, that was the big deal. Right. It had its perks. <laughs> it, had, it had its perks. Uh -huh. uh, I was surprised to get into MIT. And, uh, did you go and look before you had applied, or how did that come about? No, or not, or just filled out the application? I don't think I went to look. I think we filled out the application. Okay. I do do know that my parents, uh, I presume, drove me there. Hard, right. hard to piece that together at this time. Uh -huh. And I had a loose connection, but I don't know if it impacted my admission or not. My father was uh, a civil engineer with an eighth grade education. He started out as a blueprint blueprint boy and worked his way up and ended up being uh, registered as a professional engineer in both Wisconsin and Illinois. Very good. I can't do that these days. Uh, when he was a young man at Wisconsin uh, Bridge and Iron, uh, there was a, uh, I don't know the senior man's uh, first name, Gilliman, who, who worked there. And uh, Gilliman had, uh, I don't know how many children, but one of his children was Ernst. And Ernst Gilliman uh, was about 13, I guess, at the time when uh, he would come into the office occasionally with his violin case, and my father sort of knew him that way. And uh, he ended up being a professor very famous professor in the circuit theory area at MIT. Uh, and uh, he was a wonderful gentleman. I recall, uh, this is jumping ahead now, but uh, after arriving at Purdue, uh, Paul Sheena was acting head of electrical engineering at the time. And I think the year after that, I believe he went to MIT for a year as a, as a visiting professor. And when he came back, I heard him comment that he had sat in on Professor Gilliman's courses. He said, I'm not sure I learned a lot about circuit theory, but I sure learned a lot about Ernst Gilliman. Interesting. <laughs> so uh, that was interesting years. What year did you enter MIT? 
entered MIT in the fall of 1951, graduated in 55. Mm -hmm. uh, had some, some thoughts about not wanting to just chase electrons all my life uh, and decided to, uh, to work on a master's degree. And, and I have a teaching assistantship. That's how you supported yourselves that way. So I recall it was $210 a month. That's all you needed <laughs> in 1955. Uh, so I, I, I got sort of interested in, in teaching. And you were still at MIT? I was still at MIT. Okay. But the teaching assistantship uh, uh, at least made me ask the question, why, why not try this? One of the people I worked for there was Tom Jones. Now, Thomas Jones came to Purdue a year after I did. I came to Purdue in 1957 uh, as a graduate instructor. That's a rank that may still be around, but I think it's seldom used. As a graduate instructor, you were sort of part of the faculty, but you were allowed to work on a degree. Uh, but Tom Jones was uh, one of my inspirations. Uh, and he was an inspiration for many people. It was partly, I think, uh, the experience of working with him that I decided I would uh, see if I could be a professor. I frankly didn't think I could make it at MIT. And I applied to a number of schools. Case Western was one of them. Uh, University of Michigan was another. Purdue was another. There, I think that was about it. But I did interview at, at all three of those schools. Mm -hmm. And came, uh, really was inspired by J. Stuart Johnson, who was the electrical engineering department head, and this would have been probably 1956, 57 academic year. I don't recall when I made that visit, but, but uh, he was academic department head and offer, offered me this assistantship. And I really came to Purdue because of him. And when I arrived the following fall, he was gone. And uh, Paul Cheetah was acting head. I don't know if this is relevant or not, but uh, one of the opportunities I had uh, while still a graduate student at MIT, I got a, a course, a, a, some sort of correspondence, I don't know if it was a phone call or a letter, from uh, Mr. Jesse Hobson. He was a vice president of United Fruit Company, and he was on uh, George Hawkins, who was Dean of Engineering at that time, he was on his visiting committee. And he invited me to lunch in, in Boston. We talked about Purdue. And I learned that uh, um, a number of things, one, one of the important things I learned was that There was a vast difference between the role that Purdue played during World War II and what MIT did. MIT developed uh, radar during World War II, uh, commercial guiding systems, uh, gun tracking, things like that. Processes. Yeah, a, a, a lot of research. Purdue trained a lot of technicians for the military, Navy technicians, electronic technicians, which I believe was sort of the beginning of the School of Technology here. Uh, so it played a different role. Uh, MIT is sometimes described as a place where you get an education by trying to get a drink from a fire hose, 
But our our class, the 1955 class, uh, was the first in uh, to, uh, first class to go through a, a revised uh, curriculum. Xerox machines were not invented then. We had we had the Ditto machines, and the notes came out blue, damp, and still you, uh, they were damp because they had just come off the press. Uh, and, and it was an interesting experience. But when I visited... You probably had stencils too. They did stencils probably, you yeah. know, with those mats. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think they probably did have some of those. <laughs> right. I know they had some here at Purdue when I came. <laughs> right. but, but Purdue was, was just in the process of revising its curriculum because uh, after the war, of course, there were the, the swell of students from the, under the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So uh, the mid-late 50s, Purdue was, was undergoing this, and I thought, this is a great opportunity. Besides, I thought, Purdue would always look good on the resume, be a good place to be from. Uh, obviously, having been served on the faculty 42 years, I never did stray very far from Purdue, but... <laughs> A lot of people come here with the idea of staying a few years and, and then going on. Uh, so Jesse Hobson told me a little bit about the history of the School of Electrical Engineering. At Purdue? At Purdue. And uh, Jay Stewart Johnson took over as department head after uh, Professor Ewing had been head for many years, decades, I believe. So, in retrospect, after I understood things a little bit better, the fact that he was no longer here when I arrived was, was very understandable. His job, I don't know if he knew this when he arrived or not, but his job was to stir the pot <laughs> and um, and he probably upset a lot of people, and, and he left. But he did a good job because he got a lot of good things going. Uh, the neat thing, uh, which attracted me to Purdue, is I knew I could be doing some active classroom teaching as opposed to just having six undergraduate labs to, <laughs> to, to watch over. And I uh, was engaged in the act of teaching and helping to develop the, the curriculum and so mm -hmm. on. And then a year after uh, I arrived, uh, Tom Jones came as, as head. He came from MIT. And uh, I made the mistake one day of telling him that he was really stuck with me because he had written a letter of recommendation for my position at Purdue. And if you knew Tom Jones, you'd know that that was not the thing to say because his immediate comeback was, and now I have both copies of the letter. <laughs> so so uh, Tom sort of put me in my place, and that was okay. Uh, he went on to become president of the University of South Carolina after five or six years here at Purdue. Uh -huh. And this is a not much to do with, with uh, Purdue's history, but uh, <clears throat> he had lived in the same town where my wife was raised and was her Sunday school teacher for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a small world. Yeah. What about Fanny? Were you married when you came here? We were married uh, just a few weeks before we came here, yes. Uh, did you met your wife at MIT? Yes. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, housing when you came here? Did they have to make a... Are you going to start doing graduate work on your PhD and teach at the same time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was... Uh, you said a graduate instructor? I was a, I was a full-time instructor. Uh, you, know, you, you could take six credit hours. That's right. pretty typical. Uh, we we found a, we found an apartment 
at First and Weldon Street, uh, up up where where are all the sororities? Is that the Acres? Is that sure. area sure. called the Acres? At that time, there was there was um, some small prefabricated homes up there, okay. and um, and they were available for for new new faculty and graduate okay. students. But we were fortunate to find something just right on campus. Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because in those days, all the seniors wore yellow corduroy trousers. And the girls had the skirts. And the girls had the skirts, and they were usually decorated with various kinds of artwork. And freshmen wore be uh, green beanies for the first three weeks or something like this. I forgot what it was. Something like that. And um, so we always had the, the parade of students going by our apartment because it was right on the route that you took from the the dorms, which are just west of campus. Yeah, well, that was nice. And you could walk to campus if you oh, wanted. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. good. Well, then, continue. So then, what, uh, go ahead, what, after you, you started teaching and doing, finishing, you're working on your degree. Well, was the next thing with Ned Lars? Was that how you start got involved in that? No, oh, okay. no. Uh, my degree was at, uh, in, in the area of statistical communication theory, and I, I began uh, research in that area and uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Professor John Hancock. And one one afternoon at one of our faculty seminars. A gentleman from biology came over to talk to us, and his name was Sam Postelwick. And you've already interviewed him, uh, but, but he t talked to us about his already tutorial system of instruction. And I said to myself, that should work in engineering. So I developed a, a, an interest in trying to apply the sort of electrical engineering technology, if you will, <coughs> to the engineering education process. So in that sense, I was kind of a maverick. I uh, was successful enough in, in the uh, mainline research area to come up through the ranks, the professorial ranks, but my real interest <coughs> was um, was was in instructional technology. And in the, let's see, the academic year of 1968-69, and the, the summers preceding and following that, uh, I took leave from the university and was with Bell Telephone Laboratories. In Murray Hill, New Jersey? No, not Murray Hill. I was in Andover, Massachusetts. Now, why would I go to Andover, Massachusetts? Partly because my wife's family was near there. <laughs> there must be something. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, And it's a nice area. It is a very nice area. You're right. Um, and when I returned from that, I was asked to um, be the laboratory coordinator for the School of Electrical Engineering. Uh, and the reason I believe I was asked to do that was because I had I had done some I had adapted uh, some of Professor Postlewaite's ideas to our undergraduate laboratories and used a combination of, of notes and audio tapes to instruct people how to use an oscilloscope, for instance, and, and some other things like that. Uh, so I became the person who sort of coordinated the labs, and at the time, the, our undergraduates were required to take something like seven laboratories in, in, in the program. Uh, Just to give some insight into some of the technology and things that was available at that time. Yes, please. Uh, 
in those days, there was very little support for faculty members. You were pretty much on your own. There was secretarial support in, in the main office, and that was about it. You could get some support for key punching. All of the computer work was batch processed and key punched on, on IBM cars. <coughs> and uh, a colleague of mine, Professor P.M. Lin, Ken Min Lin, was the, uh, was the professor in charge of one of these laboratories. <coughs> And if you had mentioned notes and duplicating and things like this, he figured out that if he could get his notes key punched as a text file, then he could send students over to the computing center and print out all of the lab manuals, <laughs> which is what he did. <laughs> so he figured Good out. Good man, Gungadin. <laughs> yeah, he, he figured out a way to do that. Uh, some of the things that I got involved with was, was uh, stimulated by, by people I had met at uh, American Society for Engineering Education Conferences. Uh, individualized instruction was one, one of the key things. People were able to uh, have a study guide and a textbook and, and perhaps some supplementary things and basically study on their own. Take an exam, which uh, typically was a mastery type of exam. If you didn't master the topics, you studied some more and took the exam again. And so, there, uh, in electrical engineering, we had three or four courses which were taught that way. Uh, two of them were in the circuit theory area, and the primary mover there for establishing those courses was. Professor William Haight. Um, I worked on developing materials for uh, our, which is now it's sort of the introduct introductory course in the computer area, digital logic design course. Uh, and as time went on, uh, we, we had a facility fairly large facility where students could study and get study materials and take the exams and so on. And for these three or four courses, we had a whole, whole slew of teaching assistants who manned the room to provide uh, technical consultation as well as administration of the exams. And then, when did you finish your degree? You, your degree you'd already finished them? Yeah. I finished my degree in 1961, yes. Okay. So. Uh, that was out of the way. That was, uh, that, that's right, that was out of the way. Uh -huh. So I think I mentioned uh, the, the year at Bell Labs, which I, I, I call it a, industrial sabbatical. They paid the whole bill, but I think everybody knew that I was going to be coming back to Purdue. So, and, and Bell Labs was, was willing to do that. Um, it was in 1970, well that can't be right. I, I did get involved with the work of the Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing, and, and my sense is that that happened around 1969 or 70. That was some, something I looked at, <coughs> around 68, 69. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, data handling and analysis. And data handling and analysis, okay. e exactly. And uh, remote, sense, remote Sensing Laboratory, which people refer to as LARS, Lars got involved with, with uh, a major experiment with NASA. Uh, there was uh, a disease affecting the corn crops throughout the country, corn blight of some sort. 
and uh, the, the mission of Lars was to try to uh, identify and, and, and map and quantify uh, agricultural uh, crops from platforms which were either airborne by, by plane or, or eventually by satellite. And the Corn Blight Watch experiment uh, provided a great opportunity because there was uh, the, uh, the crops looked very different if they were diseased or if they were not diseased. Right. Uh, again, with the technology, there, there were no such things as, as color displays. Uh, and, and the The way we got maps of things was that <coughs> line printers were used to make grayscale maps. If you take all of the different kinds of, of characters that you can that you can uh, produce with a typewriter, things like a space or a period are not very dense, but things like a W or an M might be much denser. If you print out pages of all the different characters and then line them up and get a group of people to tell you which one's darker than the last last one, you can come up with grayscale uh, grayscale images of croplands, and you can hire uh, during the summer you can hire uh, high school students with different colored magic markers. And it's sort of like paint by number, and this is how some of the images were produced. Very interesting. Very Good point. Very interesting. Very Researchers will benefit by that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, well, to handle the amount of data we had to handle, we had also worked with a group of, of people at Johnson Spacecraft Center. And it was necessary to, to train those people on how, how to do the analysis using the, the software that was developed at, at the remote mm -hmm. sensing laboratory. And so a number of short courses were, were developed that we taught in Houston, and, and I got involved as, as the uh, program leader for technology transfer, and uh, had two or three people in, in my group who basically were full-time instructors in this. You did, you did the training as well as the materials, too? You did training? Yes. Training, okay. Yeah. And then the diff different sites, different locations? As we had people here at Purdue, and we also did training at the Johnson Spacecraft Center in Houston. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. That was a big, that was a landmark you know, people talk about that, and in those days, considering, you know, pretty good. <clears throat> what was the next, uh, what did you do then after that? Did you talk a little about your teaching or? And, uh, well, o overlapping, uh, overlapping my time at, at, at Lars to some extent, uh, A group of us uh, wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation. The people involved were, in addition to myself, uh, Bill LeBold from Freshman Engineering, Warren Seibert. We had a group that did a lot of statistical work, educational research work, and Warren was with that group. And, I know that his office was up where space management was, and mm -hmm. just where that fit within. Right. You mean Warren, uh, Warren Seibert or Bill of Bowles? Uh, Warren Seibert. Warren Seibert, yeah. yeah. And Bob Anderson, Bob Anderson was head of uh, engineering continuing education at the time. We wrote a proposal uh, to establish a Center for Instructional De Development in Engineering, which we abbreviated as CIDE. And uh, 
I was I was director of that for the uh, the period of the grant plus another year or so. Uh, and it, my life has been very exciting. I was born at the right time and at times a little too early. <laughs> so <coughs> the Center for Instructional <laughs> Development in Engineering uh, was in existence prior to uh, the, the central I think there's an instructional development center within housed here in, in Stewart Center. Right. CIA Center for Instructional Excellence or something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Uh, but yours was primarily for engineering? Mine was primarily for engineering. Right. Uh, or is this the other is much broader? The other was much broader, exa right. exactly. And uh, basically, my uh, efforts were to try to get uh, people in other engineering departments and schools to consider uh, some things other than the traditional three one-hour lectures a week for a three-hour credit course. Right. And we did this by, uh, by having some workshops, having some outside speakers come in, uh, trying to uh, work with faculty in the various departments to help them work on projects or help write proposals and so forth. Were the computers coming in then? Did you have access? Were you using those now? At this point? Computers were coming in at that time uh, and there was efforts uh, at various places like uh, Carnegie Mellon and University of Illinois to do computer-based instruction, mm -hmm. and, and we, we diddled with that a little bit sure. too, uh, diddled with some ideas that, that are now commonplace with, with the web sure. and understand. color displays and things like this. Yeah, I understand, yeah. But you were able to avail yourself of some of those, those that were coming down, right? Yes. Okay. yes. Good. Then what was what, uh, what after that? Uh, what sort of things did you get involved in? Looking at your notes. This was after you weren't that much involved with Lars. I mean, was that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. <laughs> uh, well, I went on sabbatical. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I went to Worcester Polytechnic Institute in in Worcester, Massachusetts. Massachusetts certainly is a popular state. <laughs> well, yes, when uh, the, the, our, this pull of family took us, took us to New England again. Uh, I, I was attracted to Worcester Poly for two reasons. One, it was a vastly different environment than Purdue. Worcester Poly is like a big high school. Something like 2,500 students, uh, uh, but it's been around a long time. It's been around. It's an old school. It's an older school. It's an older school. It's a uh, has a good reputation. It's one of th sort of three in that category. Rose Holman here here in Terre Haute being being another one, and Harry Mudd on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, my mission there was to learn all I could about computer engineering because uh, I, I, I'd have to confirm dates here, but it was about this time, either, either before or after, <coughs> that the School of Electrical Engineering became the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I felt that uh, I could make a contribution in that area with an electrical engineering background I sense that as time went on, many of the professors in, in the computer engineering would probably come from computer science backgrounds and would not have, have the, the, as much hardware orientation. So I went off to learn software and, and, and hardware, and uh, also to just experience working in a, in a small school. 
And then upon return, returning from that sabbatical, which was in, in the fall of 84, uh, the rest of my teaching career was involved in teaching uh, courses related to primarily the introductory courses in the computer engineering area. Mm -hmm. okay. at, at that time, uh, <laughs> all of our students were required to take a, a programming course, which at the time seemed of course, everybody takes a programming course. If you look at the curriculum today, yes, there is a programming course, but the, it's it's not the same thing. <laughs> uh, um, I worked with well, one of the things that uh, that you do in a programming course is you assign homework <laughs> where you have to show the programs work and so on. That it runs. That it runs, exactly, exactly. And <clears throat> uh, I felt that the best way to show this is to actually show that it runs on the computer. <clears throat> and so I think we broke from the traditional three lectures a week to two lectures plus a lab session. And during the lab session, uh, students were to be able to demonstrate that their programs ran, and also it served as uh, a place to do examinations. Uh, paper and pencil exams for a programming course uh, is pretty artificial. So the idea was to put them in an environment where they had to really prove that they could make the computer do what they want, wanted the computer to do. Just like they're on the job. Yeah. And I was, one of the persons I was working with there is, uh, was Leah Jameson, who is now a dean of the College of Engineering. Also, let me look something up here. I don't know if you want to turn this off for that or not. Okay, okay. Go ahead. About the same time period uh, when I was working with the uh, programming course in laboratories, and that that was in, in the early 1980s, 81, 82. Uh, the engineering computer network was, was just growing and, and, and faculty members uh, in various schools were learning about email and, and uh, text processing and things like this. And for two or three summers, I, I, I ran uh, one week short courses for faculty so that they could learn send email, receive email, uh, how, how to work with uh, the VI editor and a number, of, a number of these things, what the file structure was and how you can find the file and those kinds of things. Basic, basic Unix operating system okay. ideas. And it, 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 was, it was interesting because uh, I had an opportunity to have colleagues from the various schools of engineering sure, right. attend this course. And, and it was a week-long thing, and it, and it was pretty much... Uh, pretty intensive, I would it, it, it was an intensive thing with a lot of practice, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe it helped a, a lot of people sure. make that jump. Right. That is a big leap. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Do you recall that... Uh, that Westinghouse one that I mentioned about in uh, 86 or 89, something like that, that uh, for the new roles, which sort of fits in with what you were talking about for the ECM, new roles in electrical engineering education. You would gotten that uh, Westinghouse that helped fund that program. Well, I, <coughs> I was fortunate in getting uh, funding from a variety of sources. Okay, well good. Uh, and you might want to comment on that. Westinghouse is one of them. Bell, uh, I think uh, 
Bell Labs was, was another. Was it, how was the funding in those days? Was it pretty competitive or a little bit easier? Or? Well, it's always competitive. And whether it was easy or not, I, right. I'm... If the government, did you, we were in government support. Yeah. NSF, NSF. Okay. NSF. And some right. private, Westinghouse would have been the private, the foundations. Yes, right. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, also during, <coughs> during the uh, late 80s, uh, as I say, I had some support from, among other people, uh, Bell Labs. I had the idea that if a professor had a student who could work with them, they might be able to develop some things for their courses based on the use of computers or, or something like that. And I had a program, a very small program, but uh, which I called the, the Double E Student Intern Program. And it was modeled partly on the co-op idea. The idea was to employ the students 20 hours a week during the academic year, uh, actually during all 12 months. And they were to work half time with the professor to help them perhaps uh, use MATLAB in the beginning circuits course. Or how could Excel spreadsheets be used uh, for engineering problem analysis. And the students would take uh, a normal load minus three credit hours. So instead of taking 17 or 18 hours, they would be taking uh, you know, 14 or 15 hours. And, and the, the deal was during the summer they could take six credit hours. And so over the 12 month period they would have as many credit hours as they would have if they were not in this program. And I think at any point in time, uh, I may have had uh, some semesters, six students doing this, working with six different faculty members, and at times, perhaps it was only three students. Uh, but it was, uh, it was an attempt to uh, provide the support the faculty needed to, to, to make the jump from what they've always been doing to something new. Uh, and I, again, with, with the, uh, <clears throat> I was sort of, <laughs> if, if I had been born three years later and did these same things, see, I would have had PowerPoint and everything to help me. So this is all pre-PowerPoint, pre-web pre days. Uh, but those were the times, and that was what was available. So that, 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 you could it, utilize it. it. Exactly right. Those were the times, and that's that's what was available. But it also allowed you to uh, then, when these other tools became a, did become available, you know, to, to make some some major leaps. Right. Exactly. It made the transition a lot easier. <clears throat> yes. And it was good exposure for the students. They got oh, working yes. with them one on one, like many of the undergrad research things that are going on at the moment. Oh, yes, yes. So it was a win-win situation. One of the interns is a, is a, is a successful uh, patent attorney at this time, and, and another young lady went to medical school, so <laughs> it was good for the students. Yeah, it's a good start <laughs> for them. <laughs> hmm. And in, in some ways, uh, all, those, all those leaves were academic uh, academic uh, problems that they were working on. In some ways, it was a precursor to the ethics program. There's, I'd say there appears to be some similarities. Because the students were involved for several semesters, which is typical of what happens in the ethics thing. And, and, and it also happened that my funding ran out the year the ethics was looking for space, and so I could say, why don't you use this lab? <laughs> So that worked out very well. Yeah. Uh, one of the most precious commodities on campus is space. <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> um, the final few years of, of my teaching were 
with the introductory digi digital logic design course. Uh, and one of the one of the unique things uh, is um, well, I have to back up a little bit. It, it seemed to me that it would be a good idea to figure out some way to make it easy for professors to make videotapes. And, and so uh, I was able to, to scrounge some equipment and set up a, a camera in my office, two cameras. One that looked down on the desk where you could do documents and so on, and one where you could get a typical head and shoulders and a little switcher thing. So it was a one a one man uh, video recording studio. Studio, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and uh, after I had it working for my office, I was able to uh, Again, it's the space issue, but I was able to uh, commandeer, so to speak, this very unacceptable office. It was small, had no window, <laughs> but it was perfect for this. And, and a camera was set up so that if a professor was going off to Washington to uh, make a presentation to his, to his uh, research sponsor and at a class, he could pre-record that lecture, and uh, just have his TA run it while, while he was out of town, and, the, and a number of professors took advantage of, of doing that. Um, another thing I did from time to time was to team teach a course. If there were two divisions of the course going on, that uh, I would work with the other professor to team teach. Uh, and one semester I was working <coughs> uh, with somebody in, in the digital logic design course. And uh, the way we divided things up, uh, he did most of the lecturing. Uh, I did all of the examinations and homework assignments and coordinated that. But each night, I attended all of the lectures, although my, my uh, colleague was, was doing the lecture. Uh, I had set up a recording, a recording studio in my den at my home. And that evening, uh, I would record the lecture material for, for that particular lesson. And ended up with some some 40 hours of, of, audio, of video recording, which then I arranged through, uh, this, I think it was the Center for Instruction Services, is that the right? Mm -hmm. CIS. Yeah, yeah CIS. Mm -hmm. uh, Purdue shares a, a channel on, on the local television cable network we share it with the Lafayette School Corporation. So Purdue has some hours and Lafayette School Corporation has other hours. So my idea was to, to broadcast these tapes. Uh, and the only time I could get was five o'clock in the morning. Five o'clock in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for several years, uh, you, you, you could get lectures on the introduction to digital logic design. Uh, the idea being that students uh, could view these lectures uh, instead of coming into class if they so chose, or they could view them in addition to coming to class if, if they wanted just a slightly different viewpoint. Uh, I got more comments from friends who apparently suffered from insomnia or something, who would be channel surfing <laughs> at, at five in the morning and, and, and catch me. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, these lectures were available for, uh, for a couple of years. Well, how was, were they pretty well used, do you think, a lot of review? Uh, the students, did they, did they have a feel? 
my sense is they weren't very used very much at all. <laughs> but once they were made, it was easy to have, have them broadcast. Sure. So well, that's all right. That's what we did. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. People, some people like to get up and at least they knew they, knew they were available. Well, <coughs> well, but not only that, they could record them. Oh, okay. See, that's right. Yeah, the students could record them. They didn't have to view them at 5 o'clock, but they knew that they were available. Sure. All right. And about this same time, uh, my colleague David Meyer from Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, was teaching uh, or doing a lot of innovative work with uh, his course uh, on microprocessors. And about that time, he he was go he also did some broadcast. We, we did some broadcasting of these tapes within the electrical engineering building. And they could be viewed uh, in a no number of spots within the building, uh, and even had uh, different courses, different lectures on different channels, so they could oh, have a variety good. of things. Sure. Uh, but but Professor Meyer also uh, was at the cutting edge then of, of digital recording and making the take, making the lectures, his lectures, available uh, over the over the web. Mm -hmm. So then they could be viewed anywhere. Right, yeah. So mm -hmm. once just kept ascending and moving on with yeah, the technology. Once again, just sort of the right behind the the uh, technology that, that you would that, that you was, wish you had. Kind of right. that you wish you had. <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> you had a couple of heads of schools that were that were Dr. Hancock was the head of the school at one time, was he not? And then you served under several heads while you were here. Yes, I'm not sure I could name all of the heads. No. <coughs> I, for a while, <laughs> in the uh, in the early '60s, uh, we we changed heads quite frequently. <laughs> and uh, one one of the senior faculty members at at the time that I was setting off to a to a sort of unscheduled but rapidly called uh, faculty meeting, so we sort of knew that something's going to be announced. And <laughs> the comment from the senior faculty member who had a conflict of some sort said, if they announce a new head, catch his name, will you? <laughs> uh, when you came, uh, president, uh, the presidents were, you were several presidents. Dr. Huggy was president when you came? Yes. Right, and then we had Dr. Hanson and Dr. Barron. That's right. Uh, when did you When did you retire? What year? I retired in uh, June of 1999. Okay. Okay. So then that was before Dr. Jiska came. But just before, I think yeah, just, just before. Right. Just yeah. before. Share before with the researchers what sort of things have you been involved in in your retirement? You got anything you care to share with us? Any activities or things that you've been doing since you retired? Did you keep on? Did you, did you come back to campus? Uh, after you retired, did you you have the option to go what half time? Did you was that available at that time? I, um, I, I fully retired in May of 1999, and uh, and I had been part time for three years. Uh, prior to that. Prior to that, two years. Uh, two years I was 75% time and one year 50%, uh, which is a bit unusual. The, the usual thing is to go half time, but, but I didn't do that. I was motivated to do that because I got involved with uh, 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 building construction and, and uh, renovation at our church, and was uh, the church's represent representative and working with the architect and so on. And so uh, the years I was uh, part-time, I, I basically was on campus Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I was uh, <laughs> down at church Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. <laughs> but uh, I did get involved uh, pretty much from the beginning with, with the EPICS program initially as a co-advisor to some of the teams and uh, 
and continued that for several years after my retirement. My wife and I moved to the University Place Retirement Community, which is just north of campus, and uh, University Place is affiliated with Purdue, and we, we encourage interaction with Purdue. Uh, I, uh, I proposed uh, to the people who were directing the ethics program at the time that they might want to consider having an ethics team at, at University Place. So that was launched in the fall, I think, of, of uh, 2003. And I was faculty advisor, uh, continued to be faculty advisor, although retired, for, for the, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and, and now still interact with the team as, as the community partner representative. Oh, that's good. Are they still involved out there? Yes. Are they? Yes. Okay. What sort of uh, project, what sort of things are they doing or have they done? One of the early things we did was to have the students work with residents to uh, act as uh, tutors or coaches for improving or, or introducing them to the use of a personal computer. Uh, that, that worked out well. All the students, of course, are pretty ex expert with computer, and, and uh, I thought it would be a good experience for them to try to teach uh, people of their, the age of their grandparents to, <laughs> to do this. That's one, one, of, one of the projects that we worked on. That's a challenge, but much needed because then they feel comfortable, you know, with it. Yes, yes. Uh, and that was an engineering, certainly an engineering service, but but uh, the the real thrust of what we're trying to do in the ethics program is is, is engineering design. Uh, so we needed something more than just the computer coaching. The, the other project that, that uh, we made the most progress on uh, within the community, <coughs> uh, one of the cable channels is uh, an announcement ch uh, channel, typical as you go to, if you go check into a major hotel, they, they've, the menu. Got, they've got the menu and, and, and things like that. And uh, <coughs> uh, University Place have been leasing a system to do this, and uh, in house. This would be an in house. This menu. was a, the, yeah. This yeah. In in, in house, and the uh, the interface for for constructing the slides that that you saw and so on was was crude compared to today's standards. And uh, I asked the ethics team to figure out a better way of doing this, and what they came up with was, was uh, to use PowerPoint, which is just as a very natural, and you can quickly learn how to do some very marvelous kind of kind of uh, with it. graphic yeah. things with it, and uh, and also develop or work with uh, the electronics necessary to to put this out on a, one of the <coughs> TV cable channels. And, and over a period of, of time, they were able to put together a system which uh, replaced the one we were leasing, and so that was... Very nice. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, the graphics are better, and it's uh, easier to do them. How did, what did the residents, I bet they were pleased with it. Well, I think we had some significant improvement over, <laughs> over what we had. So. And more of them probably are using it now. <coughs> if it's a little more attractive, you, you tend to look at it. If it's not, then you know, I'm not going to bother or something. That's so right. So That's it right. catches. A couple things. That you got some nice awards. You're in the Purdue Book of Good, Great Teachers, which is really nice. And uh, you got your American Society of Engineering Education Distinguished Service Award. And uh, the Chester Carlson Award, from the, also from the American Society for Engineering Education. You've been pretty involved with that association, I imagine, over time. Uh, with, with ASWE, American Society. Well, I was involved in uh, 
two professional societies. One is the uh, IEEE Institute of Electrical and, and Electronics Engineers. That's <coughs> and uh, ASEE, which is the American Society for Engineering Education. Uh, it was during the year I was at, at Bell Labs, 1968. Uh, I had asked my then department chair, which, which was Tom Jones at the time, mm -hmm. uh, how I could get involved with the, the, the IEEE has various sort of subgroups, now called societies, and uh, there's an education society. How do I get involved with that? And uh, I guess he made a phone call or two, and <laughs> I was invited to, to go to a meeting in New York uh, at the IEEE headquarters. I came home and told my wife, you know, I felt like I just stepped on a ship that was sinking <laughs> because uh, it was called the, the IEEE Education Group at that time, and uh, they were under pressure. They had only about 2,000 members, and they were under pressure because of the cost of the transactions was going through the roof and so on. But the, the solution was to uh, provide more services for, for the membership. And one was, was a, a conference called the Frontiers in Education Conference. So the first Frontiers in Education Conference was held in 1971 or 1970. One of the, one of those years. And I had I had also the previous year attended uh, a national ASEE conference and presented the paper there and got involved with a group called the Ed, uh, Educational Research and Methods Group within ASEE. So we were going to have this conference called Frontiers of Education Conference at Georgia Tech. And the first year, uh, what do you do? You end up with all invited papers. Well, I had met a number of really interesting and innovative people at the ASCE meeting. One of them being a, a Purdue graduate, Lee Harrisburg. Uh, who was a mechanical engineering graduate from Purdue. And he was doing innovative things like having students work on, on uh, design projects that, uh, for industry, <laughs> uh, self-based instruction, a, a number of things. So it turned out that at this first conference, about half the papers were from <coughs> uh, ASCE members who were also part of the Educational Research and Methods group. The second conference was at uh, University of Arizona <coughs> in Tucson. And there were a lot of ASCE people there too. So that's the time when uh, the two groups, the ERM division of ASCE and the IEEE Education Group, uh, began to co-sponsor this conference. Uh, and I can't remember all the details, but since I had one foot in each camp, uh, I, I feel I had some impact in, in, in bringing that about. Sure. Sounds like it. Yeah. Third conference in 1972 was here at Purdue. You've mentioned Larry, Professor Larry Ogborn, one of my colleagues, as uh, in our conversations here, and Larry, I think, served as treasurer of, of that for the conference. Uh, I was gen general chairman, and uh, the conference still goes on. Very good. So, 
<clears throat> one of the uh, <clears throat> one of the awards for the conference was the Helen Plants Award. Helen Plants <clears throat> was a professor of mechanical engineering at um, West Virginia University, and she was uh, very instrumental in uh, things like self-based instruction, and so on. Problem solving mm -hmm. techniques. And the Helen Plants Award uh, is presented to uh, a person or persons who have had uh, a non traditional session at the, at, at the conference. Uh, traditional conferences, people stand up, they kind of give their paper, sometimes they just read their paper, <laughs> sometimes it's a <laughs> It's a little more exciting than that, but uh, one of the things we wanted to do at, at the, within the Frontiers in Education Conference theme was was to to show that you could do things differently. Uh, and uh, our, our, I was able to get that award on, on several occasions, actually. I have to look it up here. I think I, working with different people, got that award three different times. Very good. Um, and one of them was working with Jim Russell from the School of Education here. Uh, right. That, that, that we, we put on a workshop or two. I guess in, 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 in in working with the conference, uh, I served in different capacities as program chairman and as general chairman and uh, things like this. Sure. And there was a committee that worried about where the next conference would be and so on. So uh, another of the awards is is uh, is a service award for the conference. So if you do this for enough enough years, sure. It's people, nice to be recognized. It's people yeah. do recognize that. Yeah. Any questions that I haven't asked? Anything in summary you'd like to say? I do want to ask, do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with the researchers? Something that comes to mind? Or maybe there were a lot, probably. Well, I'll go back to, to mentioning Sam Postlewaite's discussion to the double E faculty back in the mid seventies or so. Right. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was it was the sixties. Uh, here was a fellow who was doing something very differently and being very successful at it. And I said, you know, we ought to be able to, we ought to be able to do like be different. Uh, at the university, if, if if you can't if you can't go out on the limb at a university <laughs> in the ivory tower, where else can you? <laughs> good point. Yeah. So I, I, that, that's good. He was a real. All right. Any. Uh, and he continues to be a real inspiration. Right. Any closing comments or that you'd like to share? Can you think of something that comes to mind? He gave us a really good good insight in the your activities in the school. Well, I think I'd like to summar summarize it this way. Okay. I had several opportunities to places where I could go to pursue the PhD. Mm -hmm. I came to Purdue because they were doing exciting things. When I retired, and since retirement, there are exciting things going on at Purdue. Purdue has been a great place to spend a career. Uh, I would advise faculty members to take advantage of the sabbatical program. You will appreciate Purdue much more to get away from here for a year and realize how good you really had it. <laughs> so I learned this uh, uh, in my career, 
I, I was away three times, which is not as much as one could be if you really worked at it, but you know, when you trade off family uh, obligations and kids in school and things like that, right. um, three sabbaticals I, I Great. worked out real well. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate this, Dr. Lindemann. This concludes our interview. Thank you. Uh,